His mother Mary was pleased to be married to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. Pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place in what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus, the word of the Lord.
That baby belongs to God. And that mother belongs to God. And we, the people of God, are called to love. Joseph, facing that moment in his life, he has a plan like we all have a plan. And something happens in that plan that's drastic to that plan. And it's the Christmas story. The story we're supposed to love. The story we're supposed to embrace. And, and here's this righteous man. What did he do to deserve to have a woman that he's betrothed to become pregnant? And not by him. Can you imagine how he felt? Any of you know what betrayal is about? Do any of you know what grief is? Do any of, you, any of you know what distrust is? Do you know how hard it is to earn somebody's trust after you've broken that trust? All of those things had to be going through Joseph's head. Here's this woman that he's known that, that's been arranged for him to marry. And then he finds out the one thing, the one thing that the law says he can divorce her for and can have her publicly stoned. That's what it says. The law of his time said he had two options, to divorce her or to have her publicly stoned. And somewhere along the line, surely he's maybe not be head over heels, googly-eyed in love with her, but he's got to love her in some fashion. And he faces this news of his plan that is blown all to pieces. That big day of celebration, the, the big day of the wedding, the big day of the consummation, they're gone. In his eyes, all that hope is gone. What's your Christmas plan? What's been your plan in your relationship with Jesus? Have there been places in your life when you've discovered something that really just blew that plan out of the water? That maybe somewhere in your life you wanted to say, God, you can just take the high road because I'm going somewhere else. Somewhere we've been coming and angst with God and we just don't really want to do what God's asking us to do. We don't want to be that person of graciousness and forgiveness because we're hurt. Because we're beat up. Because we got treated bad by our family or a loved one broke our heart or our one way relationship betrayed us and we've lost their trust. All of those things go on in our lives each and every day. Somebody dies. Is that part of the Christmas story? This is supposed to be the time, the season of, of goodwill, and yet we still lose loved ones. Hey, God, could you put death on hold for a little while? I had a Christmas break back in the church I served. We shut down when the schools did, and we didn't come back until the schools did, except for special occasions. I worked every day of that break because of death. Because of death, and I slipped into Christmas Eve service. God doesn't stop. The world doesn't stop. Because of what we think our plans ought to be. Life goes on. And just because God's given us a Messiah doesn't mean it's going to be a rose garden. Just because we've claimed Christ as Savior doesn't mean that our life is going to be all pretty. It doesn't mean we're all going to love each other, even in the same household. It doesn't mean that our marriages are going to be be perfect. It doesn't mean that our relationship with our children are always going to be good. It doesn't mean that our children are always going to do what we want them to do. It doesn't mean that our grades are and on and on. It means we're going to live life with God. You see, Joseph was an educated man. He was righteous and he knew the law and he had the plans. He had gone about arranging the marriage. The families had, had gone about arranging the marriage and then all of a sudden this, this hiccup You had to think, man, what are my friends going to say about me? Can you imagine the gossip around the town? Y'all know that Mary? She's pregnant. We thought Joseph was righteous. Wonder what they've been doing. Can you hear the gossip? But Joseph devised a plan. He doesn't want to. He loves her enough. He's not going to disgrace her. He's just going to quietly divorce her in the way that he could. He's not going to ask her to be stoned in the pub at the city gate. He's just going to walk away quietly. You know, God has a plan for our lives. And there are times in our lives when God asks us to do things, and some of us make the same decision Joseph does. We decide to walk away quietly. We divorce ourselves from the love of God. 
because it's too hard. Because it doesn't fit our plan. Because it's not the picture of the baby Jesus in the manger and everybody's happy and everybody's getting along. So what do we do? We quietly turn our back. Some of us not so quietly. We go shouting and screaming. Disrupting everybody else's lives. Wrecking everybody else's lives. But some of us go quietly. And we just divorce ourselves from the love of God. But God doesn't give up on us. Ever. And there's proof of that in the text today. We've looked at a righteous man who made a decision to walk away from what God was doing in his life. And God said, whoa, I don't think so. I just don't think so. After Joseph had, I love this, after Joseph had considered these things, you know what that means? After Joseph had made alternative plans, right? After Joseph had put the weight of the world on his shoulder and made decisions about his life, the Lord appeared to him as an angel and said to him, and said, hey, Joe, it's good. What's happening is not really what you think is happening. Yeah, she's pregnant. But it's not by any other human being. It's the work of God in fulfillment of the text, in fulfillment of the pro pro prophecy. You know the prophet Isaiah? That Joseph... All that despair you're feeling, all that betrayal you're feeling, you let God carry that. But I need you to go walk alongside her. Because the world's going to be hard enough on Mary. I need you to stand alongside her. I need you to walk with her. And that boy, when he's born, though he may biologically not be yours, <coughs> he needs you. He needs a dad who can call him by his name. The name that God gave him. And you can name him Jesus. Jesus was a common name. It was a name that, that lots of people use all the time. They don't use it much anymore. But they call him Jesus. And he said, Joseph, I just need you to step in. I need you to change your plans of life a little bit. And I need you to step in and fill that father role. I love Joseph. I think that Joseph is one of the most overlooked, greatest characters in the Bible. Because he was asked to rear Jesus, to raise Jesus, to teach Jesus what it means to be a man of God. <clears throat> Joseph, I have a portrait in my office, if you've ever been in there, behind my desk, a lady who called herself my armor bearer, and God had gifted her as a great, a great um, artist. And so she, she always prayed. Every Sunday morning she would come to my office and she would give me this big hug. She was a rather large lady. And she would come in and I'd have to get up from behind my desk. And she'd just give me this big old hug. And in her, in my ear every week, I've got you in prayer. I've got you in prayer. I've got you in prayer. No matter how hard I'd study or how hurried my week had happened, I knew this lady would come in and give me a big hug. And she called herself my armor bearer. And every week she promised me she had me in prayer. Until she walked in one week. And she said, you know what God's done for you? I don't know. Been in the process. I moved up to be the senior minister of the church, and that was overwhelming a little bit. And God had asked us to adopt two children and add to our family and make it from a little family of three to a family of five. And my world was kind of going chaotic. And she walks in with this, this paper wrapped frame thing. And I opened it. It's a picture of Joseph holding the boy Jesus. And looking down on him with love, he said, she said, you know, God's, God's asked you to care for people because they need what you have to offer from God. So it hangs in my office because of Joseph. It hangs in my office because I understand what God asks us to do sometimes doesn't always go along with our plan in life. That God asks us to do something different than maybe what we envisioned. And it doesn't mean that everything's going to be smooth and bumpy. I work for the church. I promise you it's not always smooth. <laughs> In fact, most of the time it's more bumpy than it is smooth. Because I work for humanity. I mean, I work for God, but I get to serve humanity. Right? And sometimes in church, listen, can we be honest? We're human beings. We have our own agendas. We have our own plans. When our plans go awry, we want to get mad at God sometimes. Joseph wasn't any different. But the angel assured him, 
that if you'll go forward with the work that God has for your life, if you'll allow yourself to, to ride over that rocky road, God can handle your anger, shout at him. God can handle your tears, cry, and lay on his shoulder. God can handle your jealousy and all the other things you want to be in this world, just like Joseph was. Because God has bigger plans for your life than you've ever dreamed. Than you've ever dreamed. And Christmas is the time when we get to celebrate that we have a God who never deserts us. No matter what happens, whether it be life, whether it be death, whether it be betrayal, whether it be distrust, whether it be uh, crime, whatever it is, God doesn't leave us in those moments. Because God sent to us a son. His name is Jesus. And you shall call him Emmanuel. Exactly what Isaiah said happened. And the angel told Joseph that he would do that. And Joseph had a decision to make. Did you know that every Christmas we invite you to walk down the Advent road with us? We go through the four different weeks of, of Advent. And we invite you to walk down the Advent road to re-examine who you are and what your relationship with God looks like. How does Jesus fit in your life? Are you walking down with your own plan like Joseph was and things are going just great, but then maybe something happens in the middle of your life, the middle of your plan, and you jetson God out of it? That's why we call the church into Advent. It's because, church, we need it. We need, we need to be shaken up by the Holy Spirit. We need to be held accountable for who we are. We need, even us leaders of the church, need to be revisited by the baby Jesus every year. Maybe every month. Maybe every week. Maybe some of us every day. And some of us every hour. Maybe some of us need to cry out to God every minute. Because we have a plan and our plans got awry and we are wrecking lives around us because and God wants to say, just like the angel said to Joseph, hey, it's okay. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're walking through, whatever's on your shoulders, whatever's in your heart, whatever's weighing you down, whatever plans have gone awry, God's got you in this. God's got you. I told you guys about a group of people that I meet with every week. We love each other. We are brothers in Christ. There are, there are six of us, and we... Some of the things we say in our meeting I can't share with you because it's just boys being boys. <laughs> but I used to meet with them every week for face to face, but now I have to do it via the internet. But there's one person in our group that no matter what we're going through, that person's response to us is God's got this. Don't ever forget God's got this. And that's what Joseph heard that night when the angel came upon him. And he said to him, look, this is just according to the prophecy. And God has chosen you. God has chosen you. You know, I wonder if, you know, the weight of Mary was on his shoulders. And then when the angel got through with him, the weight of God was on his shoulders. You know, Mary was nothing after that. Because <laughs> God said, hey, I need you to raise my son. I need you to accept the role of the father. To a child that's not biologically yours. I need you to teach him and to raise him. So that when the time comes. He can fulfill what it is he's called to do. <clears throat> and Joseph chose to say yes to that. It's something we as the people of God need to hear. That Joseph's life got changed. That God laid the responsibility of raising Jesus on Joseph's shoulders. A man who had no tithe. A man who could legally walk away. And God sent an angel to him and said, hey, I need you. And Joseph made a decision that day to say, okay, I'll be a part of your plan. I'll be a part of your plan, God. Even though it's not exactly where I wanted it to go, even though it doesn't look like exactly what I thought it would look like, I'm willing to go forward. I'm willing to walk forward because I may have to accept somebody new into my life. I may have to let go of somebody in my life. I may have to have a Christmas where my grandmother's died. And every Christmas I'm going to remember my grandmother. Or I may have to have a Christmas where I know my family's not going to get together because we're so dysfunctional we can't be in the same room together. But every Christmas of God, I'm going to remember my family because you asked me to remember my family. You see, we come from all those walks of life and God continues to walk in our, and shape our plan in our life as long as we walk with God. 
He said they would call him Emmanuel. Do you know what that means? God with us. It doesn't mean God is us, or God is ahead of us, or God loves us. You get that? I mean, it doesn't mean that we're following some great white horse warrior walking down the path saying, yeah, God, go God. It doesn't mean that God's behind us pushing us, although sometimes we need it. It means God is with us. You know what it means to be with somebody? To be with somebody? Present. Present. I went home for Thanksgiving to Amarillo. And on purpose, I left on Monday night so that I could be there Tuesday morning at 11.45. And though every week I meet in my office and I pick up, turn my cell phone or speakerphone and we have a FaceTime together, and me and the men, we all have our discussion, I walk into a church where I used to serve. And I sit at the head of the conference table like I used to sit at the conference table. And all the men gathered. And we were with one another. We could see one another. I could, I could see when they answered the question what was really going on in their lives because I could read their eyes. I could put my physical arms around their big old bodies. Well, maybe mine's one of the biggest. But we could, <laughs> we could hug each other. And we knew that we were with one another. And I could listen and we could listen together to what was going on in each other's lives. And, and we could talk about the surgeries that one of them was upcoming and we, we could hear about the pain of a marriage and other ones walking through after 30 something years they're walking through a pain in their marriage and, and, we, and we could be with one another. Do you understand what Emmanuel means? Emmanuel means that God is with us. So Joseph was asked to raise a child who would be called Jesus that he would represent God with us. You see, because we as human beings, we don't quite get it when we think about this God that's all big and all powerful and all those things. We needed a God to walk with us, a God who understood what it means to get angry when they abused the temple, a God to understand what it means when you ask somebody to serve and follow and be along with you, and yet that person betrays you, or you ask a person to be your friend, and yet around other friends, they deny you. You see, we needed a God who would walk with us and explain things to us and teach us how to take care of those people that we overlook. You know, the ones who are hungry and the ones who are sick and the ones who are sad and the ones who are on the, the verge of, of the community, on the edges of the community. We needed a God who showed us who would be with us and reach out and pull those people in so that we, the people of God, could see what it means to love people. That's the God we serve. That's why we go through Advent every week is so that we can wrestle with the decisions made by Joseph and we can decide, God, is it, are we walking our plan? Are we making our plan? Or have there been hiccups in our lives or wrecks in our lives when we've just jettoned you out of the picture and we need to come home? We need to come back to that relationship and we need to see that beautiful present of that baby child laying in that manger with those wonderful angels standing around and the wise men and the shepherds and we need our heart to be refreshed. And we need to hear the words when we sing Emmanuel. God is with us in all that we do. Because we claim Jesus as Savior, God is with us. People of God, lovers of the Christ, creations of the Most High, let us see the gift. Let us embrace the plan and let us walk with our Emmanuel. Amen. Amen.